It was a cold winter's day in Belfast, Northern Ireland, on Monday, December 20th, 2004. Just days away from Christmas, the streets were filled with shoppers eager to get last-minute presents and other items in preparation for the big day. The Northern Bank Cash Center on Donegal Square, right in the center of Belfast, was incredibly busy, and with it being Christmas, it had a much larger amount of cash than any other time of the year. The staff members who worked at the bank were looking forward to their Christmas break, with only a few days to go before their holidays. A little before 6 p.m., the assistant branch manager, Kevin McMullen, told all but one of the members of the staff to go home early as a Christmas treat. Once they'd left, Kevin McMullen and the other staff member, Chris Ward, went down to the vault and began to place 50-pound notes into a large sports bag. They then carried this bag past the unsuspecting security guards and out onto the busy street. This is the story of the Northern Bank Robbery. A day prior, Sunday, December 19th, 2004, Chris Ward was at home with his family in Polglass on the outskirts of West Belfast. Chris was 24 years old and was a bank supervisor at the Northern Bank, one of the four main Irish banks. Just before 10 p.m., there was a knock at his front door. Chris answered and saw a man that he did not recognize, who began asking him about tickets for the next Celtic football match, which wasn't unusual because Chris worked for the club as a secretary and did organize tickets. It was a bitterly cold night, so Chris invited the man into his house to discuss the tickets briefly. As soon as they stepped through the door, though, a second man appeared, holding a gun. Both of these men forced Chris to return into his living room, where he and his family were held at gunpoint. Chris's family members were then tied up and threatened. Chris believed that these two men must have been watching his family for some time, due to their knowledge of him and his family members. In an interview with BBC Spotlight, Chris would say, It was just terrifying. Even the fact that they knew I was involved in Celtic, they knew where I lived. They knew my family. They knew my family's names. They knew about my brother and his girlfriend. Chris was then taken upstairs and told to pack a bag, including his work uniform, which they said he would need for the next day. At the same time, his family were given what has only been described as a holy picture, so likely one representing Jesus or another Christian figure, and were told to swear on it that they were not going to cause any trouble. Forced to leave his family behind, Chris was taken into a three-door car and placed onto the floor of the vehicle. The two men explained that they were going to be driving around for about 45 minutes and that Chris should remain calm. Chris began to wonder if this was related to his job at the Northern Bank, and after he saw a sign for Lockin Island, he suspected that he was being taken to a bank colleague's home. At the same time that the men had entered Chris Ward's home, about 30 miles away and just outside of Belfast, assistant branch manager Kevin McMullen was sitting and watching television with his wife, Karen. There was a knock at the door, and Karen went to answer it. Standing there were two men dressed as police officers, who told her that a member of her family had been in a serious car accident. Shocked, Karen let them in and took them to Kevin, but something about them made him suspicious and he began questioning them. Almost as soon as he did, they pulled a gun and told both to cooperate or die. Chris and Karen's hands were tied behind their backs, and Karen was then forced into a boiler suit with a hood being placed over her head. She was then taken out into a vehicle, while Kevin watched on helplessly. In a statement made by Kevin in 2008, he stated, They said they would shoot her in the head, and used the phrase that was used repeatedly throughout the night, that we will damage her beyond repair. Chris Ward's suspicion about being taken to a colleague's house turned out to be correct. He was taken to Kevin McMullen's home. They were placed on a sofa together at gunpoint, and Chris said that they were threatened and that he was kicked numerous times by one of the gang members. The two men had worked together at the bank, but they did not really know each other due to Kevin being a executive that was higher up in the corporate ladder. Both men were interrogated about their roles in the bank and other information related to it for several hours, including information about the bank's layout, staff arrangements, and what kind of security the building had. However, 
It turned out that the gang members knew all of this information beforehand and were merely double checking that their information was up to date. Once these interrogations were over, the two men were told to get some sleep due to the next day being a busy one. And they were both given mobile phones so that they could be in constant contact with the members of this gang. The armed men left the two bank executives at around 6.30 a.m. and told them that they would be in touch via the mobile phones. According to Kevin McMullen, the two men spoke and we said, we are going to do whatever we have to do here to make sure Chris's family and Karen are safe. The two men's shifts were due to start at midday. Kevin dropped Chris off away from the bank so that they arrived into work separately to avoid arousing suspicion. Once they got into work, they started their workday off as normal so that their colleagues did not suspect anything. According to Chris Ward, you had to act as if nothing was wrong. It was very difficult to do, but you knew in the back of your head that you had to do it, that you could not tell anybody. Throughout the day, both men were contacted by members of the gang to check in, being asked to make sure that everything was in order, and were then given instructions of what to do once the plan was in motion. A few hours into the workday, Kevin was told to make up an excuse to get the other bank staff members to leave three hours early. The staff just assumed that it was a Christmas treat. Kevin later explained, I told them that there had been a problem with the balance and myself and Chris were going to have to do a full note count. I told them that they were dismissed and everyone could go home. It did not take them very long to go. I think they were happy enough to get away. It was just after 6 p.m. when everyone else had left. Once they were gone, Kevin and Chris had to phone the gang and tell them that they were ready to start. The men were told to go down to the bank vault and carry out a dummy run of the money to test the bank's security. They had to fill a sports bag with as many 50 pound notes as they could, which totaled approximately 1 million pounds. There were two security guards on duty that evening, but Chris was able to carry the bag through both security doors without arousing suspicion. A short distance from the bank, a man in a baseball cap was waiting for Chris. The man took the bag before explaining that Chris had to return to the bank where they would receive further instructions. With the dummy run proving to be a success, Chris and Kevin were tasked with carrying out the real robbery. They were instructed to get 24 crates and fill them with 20 and 50 pound notes. They then had to load the crates onto trolleys and push them to the lift and up to a loading bay. The loading bay was used by Securacor, a security company, to deliver and collect the cash that was then sent to and from the bank's branches. To avoid suspicion, Kevin told the security guards that they were doing a clean out and that they would be taking a large amount of rubbish up to the loading bay, where a van would be waiting to dispose of it. The men used some broken furniture to cover the crates to further solidify their story. It took several runs to bring up all the crates, and the security team had to buzz them up each time. The two men then waited outside the loading bay for the van to arrive, where they then helped the driver load the crates onto the van at around 8.30pm. After this, they then had to do the same thing again with the rest of the money. Chris and Kevin were concerned that the security guards would become suspicious due to the large amount of crates and they were worried for their family's safety if they were caught. But security actually notified the two men when the van had returned, so they were able to carry the other crates up to the loading bay with no issues. They were instructed to return to the vault to clean up, lock everything, and get rid of any evidence of the robbery. They were finally done at around 10 p.m and were then told to leave the bank and return to Chris Ward's house. Although some other sources state that they were dropped off just outside of town and had to find their own ride home. After being held hostage for over 24 hours, Chris's family was released unharmed, but Kevin's wife wasn't in the house. It was later learned that Karen had been blindfolded and taken to Drumkira Forest near their home for the full 24 hours that she was held hostage. Her car had been burned out and she had to walk barefoot to a nearby home to find help. The people there contacted authorities and she was then taken to the hospital. At 11.45 p.m., once Chris Ward knew that his family was safe, he contacted the Police Service of Northern Ireland, the PSNI, and told them what had happened. 
The PSNI's Crime Operations Department was immediately called in to assist with the investigation. As early as midnight, rumors in Belfast were starting to circulate regarding a large-scale bank robbery. The morning after, the Belfast Telegraph established that a robbery had taken place that totaled tens of millions of pounds from the Northern Bank. In response to this, a police spokesman stated, Detectives are investigating the removal of a substantial amount of cash from a bank in the Belfast area. There are no further details at this moment. As a result of the media attention, a Northern Bank spokesman insisted that the banks were running as normal and that their customers would not be affected by the robbery. A huge police investigation started, although the PSNI faced criticism early on that such a large-scale raid could happen and that they had no knowledge of it. They had to deny that their investigation was botched from the get-go. They admitted that they were able to track some of the money which had gone south of the border as early as 48 hours after the robbery. The Irish Garda, the police for the Republic of Ireland, raided two homes in Dublin with the hopes that some of the money could be recovered, but none was found. The PSNI also conducted numerous interviews with Chris and Kevin to try and gain as much information as possible. They had thousands of hours of CCTV footage from in and around the bank, but the quality was pretty poor and did not really help them with their ongoing investigation. There was also no CCTV footage from the Loading Bay area, due to the gang members never stepping foot inside of the bank, the police could not rely on any real forensic evidence either. With a lack of evidence, the police began to publicly suspect the Irish Republican Army, known as the IRA, of being involved. The IRA immediately denied their involvement, with there being significant peace talks between the government and the IRA taking place at the same time. This accusation seemed to be threatening to destabilize the progress made by these meetings. The reason behind these peace talks was a result of decades of violence in Ireland. And for some backstory, let's rewind just a little bit. In April 1916, approximately 1,200 Irish Republicans launched the Easter Rising against the British control of Ireland and issued a written proclamation calling for an Irish Republic and that, quote, the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland, unquote. The uprising was crushed after seven days of fighting between the Irish Republican Army and the British Army, which resulted in nearly 500 deaths and over 2,000 injuries most of which were civilians. Despite this, popularity for an independent Ireland began to increase, and the Republican Party Sinn Féin won a landslide victory in the December 1918 election. This led to them creating a breakaway government in January 1919 called Doyle Éireann and declaring Irish independence. By September of that year, the British government outlawed both Doyle Éireann and Sinn Féin, which increased rising tensions. The IRA began attacking the RIC, the Royal Irish Constabulary, and British Army patrols by attacking their barracks. The British government responded by sending more troops to bolster the numbers of the RIC by around 10,000. Known as Black and Tans, they were mostly made up of former British soldiers from World War I. However, they were infamous for their brutality and overall lacking discipline. They would often attack and kill civilians, in particular Republicans, as revenge for IRA attacks. Businesses and homes were also burned down. By mid-1920, Republicans had won control of most county councils, undermining British authority in most of the south and west of Ireland. The British government passed the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act in 1920, which allowed the courts to increase the number of convictions of the IRA by using court-martials rather than trials by jury in areas where the rebels were particularly prevalent. By December of 1920, approximately 300 people had been killed as a result of the conflict, but this escalated on November 21st, 1920, known forever as Bloody Sunday. The IRA assassinated 14 British intelligence operatives that were living in Dublin. In retaliation, members of the RIC opened fire on a crowd at a Gaelic football match at Croke Park, killing 14 civilians and wounding at least 60 others. That evening, the two higher-up IRA members, Dick McKee and Peter Clancy, that had helped plan the assassinations, were beaten and killed in Dublin Castle. A civilian named Connor Clune, who happened to have been caught up with the others, was also killed. Their bodies showed signs of torture, although those responsible said that they had been killed as a result of an escape attempt. 
As a result of Bloody Sunday, the Irish people turned against British authorities. Several children were among those killed at the football match, which made international headlines and caused an uproar throughout most of the world. In May of 1921, Ireland was separated into two under British law by the Government of Ireland Act, creating Southern Ireland and Northern Ireland. By July of that year, a ceasefire was called between the two sides. Post-ceasefire talks took place, which led to the Anglo-Irish Treaty being signed on December 6, 1921. This treaty ended British rule of Ireland, and instead, the Irish Free State was created. The treaty caused an Irish civil war, with one side being pro-treaty and the other opposing it. Those that opposed the treaty were made up of the IRA, who believed that it went against the Irish Republic that had been proclaimed during the Easter Rising. After considerable violence and hundreds of deaths, the pro-treaty side won out due to them having access to weapons from the British government. The Northern Ireland Parliament chose to opt out of the Irish Free State in 1922, which further cemented the partition of Ireland. Northern Ireland now remained with the United Kingdom, more importantly under British authority, whereas Southern Ireland was now its own dominion. A small remnant of the IRA continued after the Irish Civil War, which would have ramifications in later years. Their goal was to overthrow both Northern and Southern Irish governments and unify Ireland, using whatever means they deemed necessary, often violent ones. Although their numbers were no longer large enough to be considered a huge threat, they tried to infiltrate Irish politics with little success. After war was declared at the start of World War II, the IRA bombed England and stole ammunition to try and weaken the British, including bombing Coventry in the West Midlands on the 25th of August, 1939. In this act, five people were killed and more than 70 were injured. They also reportedly tried to ally themselves with Germany by offering to provide them with information on the British forces if they sent resources such as radios and weapons in return. A member of the German military intelligence, Gunther Schutz, was parachuted in and a deal was actually struck, with the IRA intending to send him back to Germany with their request. An IRA courier was intercepted on a train, however, and Schutz and those with him were arrested hours before their ship was due to set sail. Several IRA members were executed or arrested throughout World War II, and by the end of the war, their numbers were greatly reduced. The IRA continued to work towards their goal of a unified Ireland by attempting to build a base politically by working alongside Sinn Féin. In the 1960s, after a series of failed attempts, the IRA began to split apart. On one side was the traditional IRA members, who wanted the party to remain the same, whereas others wanted it to have a more Marxist viewpoint and to be more engaged in politics. This split became more pronounced when tensions between Catholics and Protestants began to worsen. Protestants were often given preferential treatment, and a lot of people in authority positions, such as the police, were all Protestants. In 1966, Protestants felt threatened after the 50-year celebration of the Easter Rising, due to the concern that it would kickstart a new IRA campaign of attacks, and so some formed a group called the Ulster Volunteer Force, who attacked and killed three people, two of whom were Catholics. This led to riots and protest breaking out throughout Ireland, with several people dying on both sides. The IRA were historically known for supporting and protecting the Catholics, but the new leadership did not want to get involved with the violence due to their political ambitions. The traditionalist members of the IRA were critical of the leadership for this decision, and they split off and created their own party known as the Provisional IRA in 1969. The Provisional IRA, often called the Provos, issued their first public statement on December 28, 1969, which read, We declare our allegiance to the 32-county Irish Republic, proclaimed at Easter 1916, established by the first Doyle Aaron in 1919, overthrown by force of arms in 1922, and suppressed to this day by the existing British-imposed 6-county and 26-county partition states. This is when the conflict between the Nationalist, often Roman Catholic, and the Unionist, often Protestant, truly began and would continue for another 30 years. Over the next three decades, the Provisional IRA and British Army were at war. In 1970, Provos came up with a three-stage plan. Defend the Nationalist areas, a combination of defense and retaliatory attacks, and then launching a guerrilla campaign against the British Army. 
provost planted bombs throughout Ireland, mostly in businesses, with there being around 150 explosions by the end of 1970. On August 9th, 1971, internment without trial was introduced throughout Northern Ireland, which led to more protest by Roman Catholics because the internments were often one-sided. These protests ended up escalating to riots, with 22 people being killed, including seven civilians by the British Army. And several thousand people had to leave their homes in Belfast due to the increasing violence. One of the bloodiest events during the 1970s was the Bogside Massacre on January 30th, 1972. In Bogside, Derry, British soldiers shot 26 unarmed civilians that were protesting the internment without trial law. 13 people died, all of whom were Catholic. This increased hostilities even more and allowed the provisional IRA to gain further support. There was a temporary ceasefire called in June of 1972, and peace talks started, but they broke down when the British government refused to accept the IRA's demands of removing the British army from Ireland and releasing all Republican prisoners. The ceasefire ended in July, and the IRA concentrated their efforts on attacking Britain. They bombed London in 1973 and by the end of the year, 45 people in England were killed as a result of further bombings. The fighting continued on into the 1980s, although the IRA's focus on bombing civilians had lessened, and instead they were focused on military targets. This is when the political side of the controversy, Sinn Féin, began to negotiate an end to the fighting. Then leader Jerry Adams conducted talks with the leader of the Labour Party in Northern Ireland and government officials. Although Adams believed that it would be a long process that may take up to 20 years to sort out. Then, in October of 1984, Provost attempted to assassinate the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher by bombing the Brighton Hotel. Five Conservative Party members were killed in the bombing, and Thatcher herself only narrowly avoided death. In the early 1990s, the provisional IRA had escalated their attacks in England, with 15 bombs being planted in 1990, going up to 57 in 1992. As was often the case with their bombings, warnings were given to authorities 30 minutes before the attacks. On August 31st, 1994, a ceasefire was called by Provos. However, this broke down when the IRA wanted Sinn Féin to be allowed to join in with the peace talks and the British government demanded that the IRA be disarmed before they would ever allow Sinn Féin into the talks. Provost called off its ceasefire with the bombing of London Docklands on February 9th, 1996. The IRA sent warnings 90 minutes before the attack, but they weren't able to fully evacuate the area, leading to two people dying and over 100 people being injured. Further attacks happened, including Manchester in June of 1996, where over 200 people were injured. It was considered the largest bomb attack in Britain since World War II. Another ceasefire was called in July of 1997, and Sinn Féin joined the peace talks in September. These talks led to the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. This agreement covered various areas, such as relations between Britain and Ireland. One of the key parts was the acceptance that a large percentage of Northern Ireland wished to remain in the United Kingdom, but that there were people in the country that wanted to unify Ireland. Both points of view were considered to be valid. The British government also agreed to replace the Government of Ireland Act of 1920 and release prisoners. Northern Ireland, moving forward, would be self-governed, with an assembly made up of 108 elected officials. Originally, the provisional IRA disagreed with the Good Friday Agreement, but Sinn Féin leaders said that they should back it so that the fighting could stop for good. In accordance with the agreement, all paramilitary groups, including the IRA, would have to fully disarm by May of 2000. This was monitored by the Independent International Commission on Decommissioning, which was created specifically to oversee this process. The IRA started this process in October of 2001, and their armed campaign was officially ended on July 28, 2005, only eight months after the Northern Bank robbery. The fighting between 1969 and 1998 are often called the Troubles, and they caused approximately 3,600 people to lose their lives and over 45,000 to be injured. This was a brief history for a very complex issue that spanned almost 100 years, but it helps to showcase how important the peace talks of 2004 were and 
how controversial it was at the time to blame the provisional IRA for the bank robbery. It caused many people to fear that the troubles would start back up all over again and both the police service of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland's Garda knew that they had to tread carefully to avoid hurting the peace talks. Thankfully, these talks continued on, even after the public allegations. In fact, some believe that the robbery might have helped pave the way for the future agreement between the government and the IRA, including the IRA's decision to dispose of all of its weapons in July of 2005. In an article published in the Irish Central by Dan Haverty in January of 2020, they state that the money gained from the Northern Bank robbery might have enabled the IRA to fund themselves without needing to use guerrilla tactics, which in turn led to them agreeing to disarm. It's believed that the money might have helped create a pension fund of sort for the Loyalists. This theory of a pension fund was popular in the months after the robbery. On December 29, 2004, the media reported that investigators looking into the raid believed that the robbery was to help fund the retirement of IRA loyalists. This idea was never proven, but it remains a very popular motive today. Now, we're going to pause for just a moment to hear a word from today's sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. If there's something that interferes with your happiness or prevents you from achieving your goals, BetterHelp Online Counseling is here for you. Through BetterHelp, you can connect with a professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. You can get help on your own time and at your own pace. And you can schedule secure video or phone sessions with your therapist, plus chat and text options. Anything you share is confidential, and you can speak to a licensed professional counselor that specializes in depression, stress, anxiety, family conflicts, LGBTQ plus concerns, grief, trauma, relationships, anything that you might be dealing with at the moment. If you are not happy with your counselor, you can request a new one at any time for no additional charge. Thousands of therapists are available worldwide at any time, and you can start communicating with them in under 24 hours. Best of all, BetterHelp is a truly affordable option. Listeners of Unresolved now get 10% off of their first month with the discount code UNRESOLVED. So, why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com unresolved. Fill out the questionnaire and let BetterHelp assess your needs and get you matched with a counselor you'll love. Once again, that's betterhelp.com unresolved. And just use the discount code UNRESOLVED. Today's episode is also brought to you by Harry's. How much could you save in one year by switching to Harry's? According to estimates, enough to buy 26 cups of coffee in New York, enough for three deep dish pizzas in Chicago, and enough to pay for six months of Netflix pretty much wherever you are. How? Well, Harry's delivers high quality razors for as little as $2 each, which is just a fraction of the price that the leading brands charge saving you hundreds of dollars over time. Harry's is a return to the essential, quality, durable blades at a fair price. Harry's delivers right to your front door and has all of your grooming needs covered in one stop. Blades, hair care and shower products, and so much more. Harry's provides premium products that won't break the bank and you can feel good about your purchase. A percentage of their proceeds are set aside for nonprofit organizations that provide mental health care for men and veterans. Listeners of my show can redeem their Harry's trial set at harrys.com unresolved. With it, you'll get a weighted ergonomic handle for a firm grip, a five blade razor with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel with aloe, and a travel blade cover to keep your razor dry and easy to grab on the go. Once again, Head to harrys.com slash unresolved to start shaving and saving today. Now, let's return to the show. A couple of weeks after the raid on the bank, on January 7, 2005, the CEO of Northern Bank, Don Price, spoke at a press conference. He reiterated that he would not be resigning, telling reporters, I have done nothing wrong. We are the victims in this. We are not the ones responsible for the raid. 
Price and his associates would also confirm just how much money had been taken from the cash center. 26.5 million pounds. Approximately 40 million pounds in today's money. To ensure that the perpetrators could not use the stolen money, Mr. Price stated that they would be withdrawing almost all of its notes, except for the five pound notes, and would be replacing them with notes of different colors. Unlike in England, where the Bank of England releases all of the notes and every bank issues the same ones, the four major banks in Ireland, the Bank of Ireland, Ulster Bank, Danske Bank, formerly known as Northern Bank, and Allied Irish Banks print their own notes. Because of this, it was only Northern Bank notes that were affected by the raid, and so it was really easy to replace them. On this, Mr. Price stated, To my knowledge, this is the first time this has been done. To minimize the impact on our customers, we are going to take the notes out of circulation ourselves. So when we bring notes back into the bank, we will take the old ones out of circulation and we will replace them with the new ones. Authorities had the serial numbers for approximately 16.5 million pounds of the notes, with the rest being impossible to trace due to them being mixed notes from other banks. Bank staff would be taking note of the serial numbers of the money coming into the banks to be swapped for the new notes, and police would be notified if any of the stolen money's serial numbers appeared. According to Don Price, there were around 300 million pounds of their notes in circulation, and it would cost the bank about 5 million pounds to replace them all. The new notes would have the same design, but be different colors with a new logo, and a different prefix that started the serial numbers. At the same press conference that this change was announced, the chief constable of the PSNI, Hugh Ord, issued a statement confirming that they considered the IRA to be the primary suspects in the robbery. This would cause some pretty huge rifts throughout British and Irish politics, with politicians believing the political party Sinn Féin to be involved. Sinn Féin is the largest Irish Republican political party and has ties to the IRA that continue to this day, although Sinn Féin leadership continue to deny it. In response to the accusation, Sinn Féin denied all knowledge of the robbery, but disputes between them and the other Irish political parties continued to worsen. The Democratic Unionist Party called for the four Sinn Féin members of Parliament, MPs, to have their allowances and privileges revoked. On January 16th, a Sinn Féin politician, Martin McGuinness, once again denied their involvement and said that he believed that the IRA did not carry out the robbery. He stated, If the IRA had been involved, there would have been a defining moment in Sinn Féin's leadership work with the IRA. It would have been totally and absolutely unacceptable to me. I don't see how it could have been in the interest of the IRA, who have made such a powerful contribution to the peace process going way back to their cessation in 1994, to be involved in such a risky operation, which would have undermined the Republican contribution to a vitally important peace process. On January 18th, Northern Bank announced that it would be moving the 40 staff members who worked at the cash center to other departments or branches in their network. They stated that this had nothing to do with confidential information that had been given to the gang responsible for the robbery. According to the BBC, a letter was sent to the staff stating that their personal security was one of the company's main priorities. The bank did not say when the moves were going to be taking place, but that it would be as soon as operationally possible. No new information was given on the robbery until the 10th of February, when it was released to the media that a property in County Tyrone, Northern Ireland, was searched in connection to the robbery. Over the course of a two-day operation, the PSNI checked the homes of two brothers, Michael and Liam Donnelly. It was never revealed why the property was searched, and nothing was found. Michael's son, Damien, said, with the biggest robbery in history, to be involved in inquiries to do with that is just beyond us. The whole of the Donnelly family has absolutely nothing to do with terrorism or bank robberies. It's not in our nature. We are out for an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. Also on the 10th of February, the Independent Monitoring Commission released its report on the Northern Bank robbery. In it, they stated that the provisional IRA were not only responsible for the robbery, but also various other robberies leading up to the bank raid, such as the abduction of people and stealing of goods from a shop about 80 miles away from Belfast in September, and the robbery of cigarettes with an approximate value of £2 million in October. The report concluded that this was done to help the IRA gain a large amount of funds and resources, and that IRA leadership would have known about the robbery and 
likely authorized it. Although the report stated that Sinn Féin may well have not known about the robbery, they needed to, quote, bear its responsibility for the continuation of PIRA of illegal paramilitary activity, and had to recognize the implications of being in this position, unquote, and proposed that financial sanctions be put on the party. In response, Sinn Féin argued that the Independent Monitoring Commission was not independent, and that the inclusion of an Alliance Party leader proved this. The British government responded by saying it would ask MPs to vote on the withdrawal of parliamentary allowances of the four Sinn Féin MPs. On February 17th, there was finally a breakthrough when the home of a man named Ted Cunningham was searched and approximately three million pounds from the bank robbery were found. Born in 1949, Cunningham lived and worked as a financial advisor in Farron, County Cork, located in the Republic of Ireland and over 270 miles away from the Northern Bank Cash Center. He was arrested and charged with money laundering, pending a trial that would not start until 2009. A further seven arrests were made a day later two of which were members of the Sinn Féin party. In response to this, Sinn Féin released a statement. Sinn Féin's position on this robbery is clear. Over the last four weeks, we have seen people rush to judgment time and time again. We would urge people to exercise caution on this occasion and allow the truth to come out. Sinn Féin has no further information about these arrests, and we will wait to see how events unfold before we comment further. All seven people were questioned, but were eventually released without charge. On the same day, 50,000 pounds worth of notes were found in the toilets of a PSNI's recreational club on New Forge Lane in Belfast. Bundled into five separate packages, the notes were confirmed to be from the bank robbery. The police concluded that it was an elaborate prank aimed at directing attention away from the events elsewhere, and that the culprits may have just been trying to cast suspicion on the police. A member of the Democratic Democratic Unionist Party, Ian Paisley Jr., said that he believed that the Republican Party had planted the money. In an interview, he stated, I think this find by the police is an act of desperation by Republicans, an attempt to throw the police off the scent. I think it indicates just how hard the Republican movement has been stung by events over the past 48 hours. In March of 2005, the new banknotes were released by Northern Bank into circulation. Anyone with the older notes would have to visit a branch to exchange them, which would make the majority of the money stolen in the bank robbery dangerous to carry, rendering it worthless. Despite this plan, there were no updates on the case until eight months later, on November 2nd. On that day, police revealed that five men had been arrested in connection with the robbery. Very little information about them was ever released to the media, other than their ages and general locations. Two were from County Tyrone and were 40 and 43 years old, respectively. Two were in their 20s, and one was in his 30s, having been arrested near Belfast. Their houses were searched, and a number of items were taken away by police. The Sinn Féin MP for South Tyrone accused the arrest of being a publicity stunt, telling the press, we have seen these kinds of stunts happening before. They swoop in and take things away. They eventually come back in a lot less a heavy glare of publicity, give whatever they had rated back, and say there was nothing on there. Two days later, Dominic McAvoy, aged 23, was charged with the robbery and accused of holding Kevin and Karen McMullen hostage. McAvoy was a builder from County Down, and his DNA was found on a hat outside of Lockin Island Road, the home of the McMullens. Also charged was Brian Arthurs, a 40-year-old from Dungannon in County Tyrone. Arthurs was a member of Sinn Féin and had ties with the IRA from a young age. In 1987, his brother Declan was among the IRA unit killed by the SAS, and Arthurs himself had been sentenced to 25 years in 1995 for possessing explosives. He was released early as a result of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. The police seemed to be making even more progress when they charged another of the men on the 7th of November. Martin McCallisky, a 42-year-old car salesman from County Tyrone, was charged with making false statements to investigators. According to the police, these false statements were in relation to a white Ford Transit van that was allegedly used in the bank robbery. However, the charges for all three men were later dropped due to a lack of definitive evidence. McAvoy's DNA was considered too low quality to be used, and there was no evidence that conclusively linked McCallisky's van to the robbery.
A month later, on December 7th, nearly a year after the Northern Bank robbery, the PSNI made an arrest in the case that surprised everyone, taking bank staff member and alleged victim, Chris Ward, into custody. Ward's house was searched several times over, and Chris was held in custody for eight days, an unprecedented time that was normally reserved for terrorists, such as IRA members. While in custody, Ward was interviewed on multiple occasions but denied any involvement in the robbery. In a statement that was read out in magistrate's court by Chris's solicitor, he accused the police of bugging his home in a bid to frame him. Police have bugged my house, a holiday in Spain, went through all my phone records, my bank accounts, hounded my friends, even going as far as Australia, and have tortured my family in an attempt to frame me with a northern bank robbery. A detective would later confirm that a surveillance device was used and had assisted them in their investigation. Chris Ward also alleged in his statement, Police have failed in all of these counts. They have held me longer than the hostage takers who seized me last year. And indeed, they have held me in a police station for longer than anyone else in the history of the North of Ireland. The county was told that there were four key areas that made up the case against Chris Ward. His actions on December 18th and 19th. His actions on the day of the raid, December 20th. His original account of what had happened. And a scheduled list of his duties and responsibilities at the bank. Chris Ward's trial was scheduled to begin in 2008, and very little happened in the investigation before then. However, in March of 2007, Don Bullman from County Cork was sentenced to four years in prison for being a member of the IRA. He had been arrested in Dublin two years earlier, after being found to be in possession of a Daz washing powder box that contained over 94,000 euros, approximately 130,000 pounds in today's money, which the Garda believed was money laundered from the Northern Bank robbery. However, since there was no evidence linking him to the robbery directly, he was only charged with being a member of the IRA. The trial for Chris Ward began on September 9th, 2008, and was held without a jury. The prosecution's main piece of evidence against him was, they alleged, that he had intentionally changed his work rotel at the last minute to ensure that he had the key to the bank vault. Assistant branch manager Kevin McMullen testified, giving his recollection of what had unfolded during the Northern Bank robbery. He described Chris's demeanor when they were first held hostage together. Quote, he was shaking, having difficulty breathing, and just said they have got my mom and dad. Unquote. Kevin went on to describe how one of the gang members acted. Quote, he made it very clear that if anything went wrong with the robbery, that the robbery didn't go according to plan, that if we did anything to try and stop the robbery, that would be the outcome, that they would shoot Karen. Unquote. However, by October of that year, the prosecution's case had completely fallen apart. It was determined that Chris's work rota had been changed due to the result of a chance decision by management and had not been his decision. The prosecution counsel Gordon Kerr QC, after this came to light, said in court, Having considered the remaining evidence and the advice of counsel, it has been concluded that it would not be proper to make further submissions. From this, the judge acquitted Chris Ward on all three counts, and he left the court an innocent man. Speaking on behalf of Chris, his solicitor Neil Murphy told reporters, This Kafka-esque farce started from the premise that Chris Ward was guilty and worked backwards, rather than commencing with the evidence and working forwards. He should have appeared at this court today as a witness for the prosecution. Instead, he found himself in the dock for a crime he did not commit, and of which he remains a victim. Investigators finally had some luck in March of 2009, when the financial advisor Ted Cunningham, after a 10-week trial, was found guilty of laundering more than 3 million pounds of money from the Northern Bank robbery. In the trial, it was revealed that Cunningham had told the police about an unknown man who he had met on four occasions and had given him roughly 4.9 million pounds. Cunningham argued during his trial that he had said that under duress due to sleep deprivation and threats that the police had made, claiming that the police said they would leak that he'd revealed the name of IRA members, which would have likely gotten him killed. However, it's also worth pointing out that Cunningham's 33-year-old son, Timothy, also pleaded guilty to four counts of money laundering. In May of 2010, another man who was investigated for laundering the stolen money was instead jailed for IRA membership. 43-year-old Tom Hanlon's fingerprints were found on one of the money bags found in Ted Cunningham's house that held money from the robbery. 
However, there wasn't enough evidence tying him to the robbery, and instead, evidence from his house was used to convict him of being a member of the IRA, including various documents and a Sinn Féin checkbook. Hanlon was later sentenced to three years and three months in prison. Later on in the year, in December, a WikiLeaks cache revealed that the former Prime Minister, also known as Trishuk, Bertie Ahern, believed that Sinn Féin leaders Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness were aware of the plans to rob the Northern Bank, and that Ahern also believed that Adams and McGuinness were members of the IRA military command, and that they had rock-solid evidence to prove it. In response, Jerry Adams said that Bertie Ahern said this at the time. We denied this, and I deny it again this morning. In May of 2012, Ted Cunningham successfully had his sentence eliminated due to an issue with the search warrant that the Garda had used on his home, which the Supreme Court considered to be unconstitutional. During his appeal, Cunningham stated that his time in prison was, quote, awful. I thought I was going to die there. It was the worst experience of my life. Unquote. Cunningham was retried in February of 2014, in which he pleaded guilty to laundering a total of 275,000 pounds and receiving checks totaling 200,000 euros. He was given a five-year suspended sentence and was banned from being a director or being employed in any financial institution. And that is honestly the last significant update in the Northern Bank robbery. Ten years after the event, only one person had been convicted, and it wasn't even someone directly involved with the robbery itself, but someone that had been contacted by a stranger to launder money for them. Speaking to the media in December of 2014, a former deputy chief constable for the PSNI, Alan McQuillan, said that he believed that the provisional IRA had ended up stealing much more money than they had originally anticipated. McQuillan stated, Unless you have a system to manage it, you are in trouble. The provost already had that system, but they probably got so much all at once that they struggled to handle it. I suspect most of the cash went south as they would want it under strict control as soon as possible. Cash is bulky and pretty traceable, and so is difficult to get rid of, especially these days in what is more and more of a cashless economy. McQuillan also believed that they would have sent the funds to contacts in other countries with lax financial controls before having the money brought back to the UK and Ireland. People with an IRA finance background had previously turned up in all sorts of places. Moldova, Turkey, the North Africa states, and Central Asia, he explained. Interest in the robbery waned in the media with the lack of new information, until 2018, which saw the release of a novel called Northern Heist, written by a former IRA member, Ricky O'Raw. The novel involves the robbery of a bank that had many similarities to the Northern Bank robbery. The robbery is committed by a criminal gang in Belfast, and the IRA are not involved in the robbery itself, but demand a cut of the proceeds. This leads to speculation that O'Ra based it on the actual robbery and to some it confirmed that the IRA had some involvement in it. In an interview for the International Crime Fiction Research Group in 2018, O'Ra denied that he knew anything about the Northern Bank robbery, stating that the book was nothing more than a composite of several different robberies he had learned about over the years, which he described as the work of a certain gang of guys. This is not different gangs running around doing different tiger kidnappings. These things are too well thought out. Despite the increased interest in the robbery due to the novel, it led to no significant new leads for the police. In 2019, Ted Cunningham went to the High Court in Dublin to appeal for a judicial review as to what happened to the £3 million that the Garda had seized from his home back in 2005. Cunningham's barrister, Baron McRory, said that they weren't asking for the money to be returned, but wanted proof of where the funds had gone. However, state barrister Seamus Clark argued that Mr. Cunningham had not proven that the money was his, and that he had had three months after his trial in 2014 to apply for a judicial review. Ultimately, Cunningham's appeal for a judicial review was denied. As of July 2020, the now 72-year-old Cunningham has been seeking to sue for refusing to return the £3 million, including suing Northern Bank, now trading as Donska Bank, and the Irish Garda. As of this episode's recording, there is no date as to when this lawsuit will be heard in court.
Over the years, one question that people and the media often ask is why Chris Ward and Kevin McMullen took part in the robbery rather than contacting police as soon as they were left alone. Chris Ward answered by saying, it's all well and good, and no disrespect to the bank, to say if you are ever kidnapped, you never ever pay out. You phone this confidential helpline. That is a Superman story. What is going to happen? Is Superman going to fly through your window and beat these men up and save your family? This is serious, serious reality stuff. There was no way in the world that I ever thought once of putting my family's lives at risk for the sake of a bank. It is unknown what happened to the two men after Chris's trial ended in 2008 and whether or not they continued to work for Northern Bank. They are only ever mentioned in reference to the robbery itself, rather than months or years later, and what their life might have looked like afterward. It has now been almost 16 years since the Northern Bank robbery. It was a robbery that took a considerable amount of planning, investigating, and manpower to pull off and it allowed the perpetrators to steal over 26 million pounds without ever stepping foot inside of the bank itself. Despite police forces from both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland investigating leads, and numerous arrests being made, only one person was ever convicted in relation to the robbery. Ted Cunningham, a financial advisor that was convicted of money laundering. No one was ever held accountable for the robbery itself and it remains unknown where the money ended up. It is unknown if the police are still actively looking into the case, but they have revealed no new information on it for almost 10 years. The complex history of Ireland and the decades of violence that occurred there mean that the level of distrust between both political sides continues to this day. The Good Friday Agreement wasn't even 30 years ago, and so much of the population of Ireland still remember the troubles and the impact that it had on their everyday lives. Because of this, it is unlikely that the IRA would ever come forward and admit involvement with something as infamous as the Northern Bank robbery, even if they were responsible due to the political repercussions. The general consensus is that the IRA was involved, either directly or indirectly, but there has never been any concrete evidence that proves that they were. Because of this, the Northern Bank robbery remains unresolved.